So welcome to our session in partnership with the EU Green Week, engaging young people as active citizens and citizen scientists. Today you'll be hearing from two different European projects um, and the first segment you'll hear from Dr Laura Fogg-Rogers and Margarita Sardo, followed by myself, Sophie Lagan, as we talk about the Clare City project. We'll then zoom in to Peter Suppinger from the Regional Environmental Centre for Central and Eastern Europe, who will discuss our formal education programme that we have developed for the Clare City project. Vera will then share her experiences. She's representing the University of Aviro and she's been working with young people throughout the course of the project. And she'll explain her role as researcher and also uh, engagement practitioner. Uh, which had developed throughout the course of the project. We'll then conclude with Dr Ender Hayes from UU Bristol as well, who will talk to us about the We Count project that is focused specifically on citizen science approaches to tackling air pollution. So as mentioned, this is the agenda for the next hour, hour and a half. There'll be a chance for questions at the end, and we'll also have a little opportunity for us to have a breakout and to understand a bit more about one of our um, models that we've been using to engage our audiences. And the primary objective of the session is to introduce different ways to involve young people in understanding more about the climate and ecological emergencies and how to activate them as citizen scientists. As mentioned, the webinar presents data from our two projects, Clare City, Citizen-Led Air Pollution Reduction in Cities, which commenced in 2016 and ended uh, this year. And we count Citizens Observing Urban Transport, which commenced last year and ends next year. We will discuss the specific challenges and opportunities that citizen inclusive modelling offers for understanding air quality, carbon emissions and their health impacts in some European cities and regions. And we'll also discuss how technology can enable young people to act as citizen scientists. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Laura Fogg Rogers to introduce the Clare City project. Hello and welcome all. So I'm just going to introduce the Clare City project, which we were reaching more than just young people. We were reaching citizens across the board. So I'm going to talk about the whole project and then you'll hear how we specifically try to reach young people later on from my colleagues. So firstly, why are we here? Well, as we know, it's this is an urgent crisis, a climate and ecological emergency. Um, we've experienced the warmest September on record globally and the impacts are being felt throughout the world. These horrific images, so ice melting, epic floods, global wildfires. We need to do something. Um, we know that it's our activities that cause climate change. Um, we've developed several infographics like these, this one here to communicate about that. They're all freely available on our website because we know that it's, it's us that are causing this. We need to work towards this as individuals and as a society to change that. We need to work towards net zero carbon emissions as soon as possible to ensure that our young people have a healthy future. Um, related to this, though, we know that the same sources of transport and heating are also produce air pollution, which is toxic for our health. These are some of our infographics that show that as well. That the, uh, those air pollutants are the cause of one in eight premature deaths. And most cities in the EU see the World Health Organization acceptable levels for nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter. And you'll see that it primarily affects vulnerable citizens, um, so from lower socioeconomic groups or with those with health conditions, the elderly and particularly young people with developing young lungs. So engaging citizens in these issues was one of the main aims of the Clare City project. We were a Horizon 2020 funded project responding to the call, improving the air quality and reducing the carbon footprint of European cities. And the project ran across six cities in Europe, which were Amsterdam in the Netherlands, the Aviro region in Portugal, Bristol in the UK, Ljubljana in Slovenia, the Liguria region in Italy and Sosnovich in Poland. And the project, first of all, we benchmarked, um, so kind of worked out what was the existing situation in each of those cities. And we modeled behavior for where we were currently at. 
And this process, this diagram here shows that from that baseline, we then went out and we engaged with cities to gather their ideas for air pollution reduction. So we did that through various ways, which I'll talk about in a minute. All these ideas were then checked with city experts through policy and stakeholder workshops. So we brought people together. We presented the citizens ideas to them and we, we checked them for we sense checked them. And then they were modelled by our modellers um, in impact assessments to see what these scenarios would do to emissions. So those ideas were quantified and then the outputs were quantified as well to show that. Um, and you can see many of our reports on our website that showed the specific plans for each city and what the citizens thought should be done about these impacts. This graph here that I'm showing you um, is one of our baseline graphs, which caused a big surprise for us in Bristol. So we modelled why people are travelling um, and we, we wanted to show different ways of doing that, aiming to see people in the data. So we looked at where people were going, not just what method they travelled by. Um, and this is source apportionment by showing emissions according to activities we actually recognise instead of just by the technology. And it shows when we did this for Bristol against all perceived wisdom, wisdom that it's commuting that causes the main issues. We actually found that leisure travel actually produces the most nitrogen dioxide. So 40 percent of journeys are for leisure destinations. And that gives a whole different way to talk to citizens and approach why and how we're traveling and what we can do about that to reduce it. So in our engagement activities, we aim to reach a broad variety of citizens from young to old. We were aiming to both generally raise awareness and actually as well involve citizens in developing our policy packages. So for public awareness, we ran city events and festivals, developed a Green Ants Act, and we organised lots of schools lessons and outreach activities as well. And then for actually co-creating our future scenarios, um, we, we used the Delphi method of surveys and workshops where we were aiming to reach consensus. We also ran mutual learning workshops between experts and stakeholders, and we developed a new Skylines game as well to kind of find out what policies people liked. And so you'll see from those pictures, the co-creation scenarios tended to attract mainly older people. So taking part in these official workshops with politicians and policymakers from across the city. So while it's easy to communicate to young people, so to send messages out to them, it's much harder to involve them in traditional decision making. So actually planning out their future and influencing things. And that's what we're going to talk about further in this webinar later as we move from dissemination to actually co-creation and activation. We'll think about how you can run those parallel decision making processes for young people. The outcomes from our project were policy packages for each city. And you can see here that these are the policies that came up for Bristol. Um, these are the kinds of things that people suggested um, that they would like to see happen to reduce carbon emissions and air pollution in their cities. And we also looked at the barriers for why people weren't changing activities now. And you can see from these quotes here from Bristol, um, it's about availability of public transport, convenience, accessibility, being able to get to where you need to go. And as the project has moved on, we're starting to hear things in other cities about things like 15 minute cities. So this idea that you need to be able to get to what you need to be able to do easily and safely kind of within 15 minutes. So these policy ideas are becoming more commonplace as our project has proceeded. And those policy ideas were then modelled for what they'd specifically do to emissions. And we produce these quantified graphs, which you can see here. You'll see that even under business as usual, so this is the BOW 2025, BOW 2035, you'll see that um, emissions will fall. So that's good news for us. Even if we kind of do nothing apart from what's already in the in the pipeline, emissions will hopefully fall over the next few years. But as we've seen with the pictures at the beginning, that's not fast enough. We need to do more. And the nice thing is that the, the citizens' ideas, as they were brought in for what could be done in cities, you'll see that these emissions fell much further and faster. So by involving citizens in developing policies for cities, we can see a dramatic change, um, a unified policy, policy scenario that brings about change faster. So we need to think about how to engage citizens much more in our policy making. 
So you can read about these ideas in our policy reports, which are on our website. And next, we're going to move on to hear about how we evaluated what did our project actually do and who did we actually reach from my colleague, Dr. Me, Margarita Sardo. Hi, everyone. Um, so today I'll be sharing with you some of our Claire City findings. So we over exceeded our orig original aim to reach at least 50,000 citizens. And in the end, over 818,000 citizens got involved in some way with Claire City Project. Social media and our website prove the best ways to reach many people with nearly 34,000 website views. However, our broad range of engagement methods allowed us to target people who might not necessarily engage with online materials on air pollution and carbon emissions. So you can see that we reach nearly 5,000 citizens um, by the, directly engaging them with our Delphi surveys and workshops. So let's look now at, at our demographics. In terms of um, who we engage with, 38% of, of our participants were females compared to 62% male participants. Class City was actually a very successful project at engaging with lots of young people. In fact, the most popular age category was 16 to 24 year olds, mostly due to the high participation in the game. Our activities were very well received. So overall, 74% of Class City participants stated they wanted to change their behavior after engaging with Class City. 98% of participants found our policy workshops useful. Of those playing our game, 21% consider themselves already knowledgeable even before they play the game. So they had a pre-existing interest and knowledge um, in the theme. And finally, 61% found the Clare City school, Schools activities useful. We, we were also able to find some interesting st statistically significant relationships. So the more participants enjoyed the activity, the more they reported that their understanding of air pollution and carbon emissions had improved. So more enjoyment leads to more understanding. On the other hand, the more participants reported that their understanding had improved, the more they reported that they would change their behavior. More understanding might lead to uh, changing uh, behavior. And finally, younger people and those with lower education to start with were more likely to say they would change their behavior. A key learning was that different activities appeal to different ages and genders. You can see on this graph that we reached a broad spectrum of society. Overall, all age categories are quite well represented due to the diversity of activities on offer. For instance, the Clare City workshop activities, being the Delphi policy workshop and Stelda workshop, attracted 66% of 45 to 54 year olds and 83 percent of 55 to 64 years old. You can't see it on this slide but we also asked participants about their enjoyment of Clare City activities and a key finding has been the younger the participants the more likely they were to say that they enjoyed the activity. We found that different activities engage men and women differently, so we needed a variety of engagement tools to reach a representative sample from society. Most activities were fairly evenly split between male and female participants, with the exceptions being the stakeholder workshops and the game. The high level of male gamer has meant the overall evaluation sex ratio is skewed toward men. The Clare City Skylines game was a success, especially with young men. We had over 2,800 unique users. In terms of policies picked, young people did not pick any radical, radical policies or massive changes, and instead they went, they went for changes that they already know. So young people were more likely to pick policies that they feel they can change, and you can see on this slide the top five priorities by uh, 16 to 34 years old. 
evaluation of the Clare City project shows the importance of designing engagement activities which will appeal to a wider variety of audiences to ensure that a broad cross-section of society can participate in engagement with policy making. We know that the more enjoyable the, the engagement activities, the more people including young people, will gain understanding about the issues and the more likely people are to make a change in their behaviour to reduce air pollution and carbon emissions and improve the health of our cities. So we really hope these results are useful to other researchers and policy makers working with young people. If you are interested in learning more about our evaluation, please follow the link on the screen where we can find the Clare City full evaluation report. We hope this report is useful. But Clare City also has other resources available. For instance, if you work with communities, please check our Community Activator Pack. I will now hand over to Sophie and our colleagues who will share the young people's specific resources and tell you about their experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. So what were some of the tools we developed to engage younger audiences? As Laura mentioned, to enable younger people to have a voice, we ran a number of parallel events and activities. Some intended to communicate and disseminate the science, while others were specifically focused on activating younger audiences. For all of our audiences, we drew from research around community engagement. And this is a really wonderful tool that's been developed by the Tamarack Institute. Uh, as you can see on this spectrum, ex ex engagement exists along the continuum. Uh, and on the one hand, it's kind of more passively informing participants. And on the other, it's more actively empowering them. So informing could take the form of, say, a presentation. A consultation might be in the form of a survey. And evolving requires, say, participants to put forward their ideas in a workshop. When it comes to collaboration, this is where we may spend a little bit more time together to come up with some solutions. While when we shift towards the empowerment model, that's when we actively hand over the reins or the responsibility and the ownership um, to participants who may already be doing stuff in this area, uh, may already be creating actions. And we are taking a facilitation role to enable them to lead the changes that they want to see. And while we would say that they all have value and would recommend a whole kind of trim approach when you do your engagements, uh, given the urgency required to tackle air pollution and climate change, it is worth that we as academics and educators do find ways to shift some of our practices towards this more empowering approach when and where we can. So where do your engagements sit on the continuum? We'd like to take a minute or so to ask you, our audience, about the ways you have engaged young people in decision making to date. So if you wouldn't mind clicking on the pencil, which is in the top left hand corner of the screen and create a tally in our chart. So if you were cl click on tally exactly, we're getting it. So if we you can color code as well, change the color and select all of the forms of engagement that you've used with your un younger audiences. You may find that you've used multiple. Uh, so just fill up the chart. <laughs> You're welcome to use multiple cells if that's applicable to, to you. And it looks like we've got a very active uh, membership here who seem to be doing work in all of these approaches but less so in the more empowering model. Uh, so we've got a pretty even split, but perhaps one or two more in consultation. So I'll stop the exercise for now. Thank you very much. So throughout the four years of the project, we went to dozens of schools and youth groups across the six cities to conduct science experiments and give presentations. 
and we headed to various city events and festivals to spread awareness, as you'll see with the image in the bottom left. Uh, we even worked with game developers to produce uh, Claire City Skylines, which is a mobile game for citizens to choose between policies with the aim of keeping the city alive. These policies selected for each city then went on to feed into local policy making. We even produced uh, an analogue version of our digital game. Uh, this one was specifically for Bristol, which we took to events where we didn't necessarily have Y, for example. Um, we weren't able to use the policy ideas generated from this game to inform uh, decision making, as it is more of an educational tool, uh, but it was used to inform children of the issues and encourage them to act. Uh, the game, actually, along with all of our resources, is available on our website at this specific address here. And we can share that with everybody afterwards. We're happy to share the slides. So just get in touch with us if you would like a copy. And following our school's engagements, we then developed an educator pack which compiled all of our school's resources. So we had over a dozen school's lessons that we created over the course of the project. And we even recently developed something called a STEAM Eco Club Challenge, uh, STEAM being science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics. So covering most subjects there. And the focus of these packs was for educators outside of the classroom, maybe in an evening, for example, to go through a six week program with students, not only to understand the science, but actually to develop um, some actions based on what they'd learnt. And it was also useful with these packs that they can be tailored to the city in which the schools are hosted. So you can make the issues relevant to those children. In the uh, six week challenge, for example, um, you can write to your MP or somebody of influence. There's even uh, top trump cards, clean air top trumps for students to print out and to play so that they can make trade offs like you would in the uh, Claire City game to learn a bit about the differences between different policy measures or ideas for, the, for a clean air future. Uh, there was a whole week or there is a whole week in the pack related to imagining a better world, a better future, which children can then kind of explore ideas t together and then take action, whether that's writing to your MP, whether that's uh, creating a campaign group or even producing an air pollution mask that they can design. So I've told you a bit of a whistle stop tour of all of our informal uh, activities that we've put together during the Clare City project. But in parallel, we ran this formal education program called My City, My School, My Home, which my colleague Peter will now introduce and explain to you. So over to Peter. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, yeah, uh, I quickly talk to you about the My City, My School, My Home activity, which we implemented within the Clare City project uh, and as you can see the main target audience uh, were the school children between 12 and 16 years old that was what we targeted and the main goal was to engage the, the school children to act on clean air carbon emissions and health uh, mainly because we know that this is the future generation and as it was already mentioned in the previous presentation, the involvement of the citizens is very important uh, into the decision making as much as it's possible. So the My City, My School, My Home activity based on an educational tool, uh, the main aim was to get children thinking and learning about the topic. So it was not a scientific thing, but really just to show th to the children what the topic is about and, and what they can do. Uh, the the main element was the so-called Clare Cities Interactive Cityscape, which was web-based interactive tool. Uh, as a first step, the children collected the environment and has data about city and the school and, and their home. And this collected data was inserted to the software through a questionnaire. Uh, and then the cityscape software created a current cityscape showing the children how their city looks like currently and then the software offered potential measures and options to make progress towards a cleaner air and a healthier city by 2030 and 2050. 
the children select <coughs> sorry from the options and at the end they came up with a mix of measures uh, based on that the cityscape software created the future cityscape of their city for 2030 and 2050 it's a schematic uh, uh, picture you can see in the middle that's what the software came up with after the children made their decision uh, on the left side of the of the slide you can see that uh, the activity wa was done in three areas in two regions in Aveiro region in Portugal and in Liguria in Italy and also in a city in Szczecinowiec in Poland and all gathered during the project 187 children were involved in this activity uh, what was interesting for us it was of course uh, came out from the chosen measures so what kind of measures and options did the children choose and uh, just very quickly some highlights from the results uh, it, it was good to see that all in all most of the team supported half the suggested measures uh, it, it means 15 measures all together in the in the software we suggested 30 measures to the children half of the measures was mostly supported and these refer to the modernization in energy systems and, and energy efficiency and also to modernizing the public transport and the, and the car fits and, and of course to the soft measures. What was a bit uh, more interesting that which were the measures the, the children mostly disagreed with and uh, you see on the slide the five measures uh, to which more than 60% of the teams disagree. So these are uh, referring to the increase of the price of fossil fuels to reduce the speed limit or the road capacity and also the car size possibly and, and also about the congestion charging scheme centers and I can see from these five measures it's, it's we can simply say that the, the children are not really in favor of the restrictive measures so which are really quite restrictive measures Uh, on the other hand, some of the measures divided the teams. Uh, it means 50-50 agreement and disagreement, let's say. And these were like banning green waste burning or restrictions on the use of solid fuels for domestic heating, which are also kind of restrictive measures. And, and also it was not that clear about the tax benefits. But interestingly, there were no big differences among the cities or regions. Uh, during the activity so relevant differences we could see only in the case of two measures one was related to the uptake of vehicles running on alternative fuels and as you can see in Liguria it was almost fully supported by the teams while it was less supported in Aveiro and in Sosnowiec and the other uh, measure where we could see a regional difference it was related to the compulsory rate of renewable energy sources for domestic heating and electricity uh, in Aveiro, it was almost fully supported, while in Liguria and in Sosnovia, these were less supported measures, but still with 70%, it's not that bad. Uh, I just want to show you uh, a little bit more detailed result from one of the regions from Liguria, as this was a region where most of the teams participated, altogether six teams registered and used the software from, from four schools. And it's also an extra element it was in Liguria that the, as the software was prepared in English language and it was available also in English language and in the national languages, uh, it was a possibility for the, for the schools and for the children to play the English version of the software. And that way the, the whole activity could be implemented not just within science uh, teaching, but, but also for language teaching that was useful. As you can see, 20 teams played in Italian and 16 used the English version in Liguria. And, and this graph shows uh, the popularity of certain measures. It's a bit similar to the previous one. And as you can see, uh, the five less supported measures are, of course, at the end of the graph, so the, the restrictive measures. But on the other end, you can see some of the measures which were fully supported, like increasing the green spaces. Uh, imposing a minimum square meter per capita for the cities, 
and also the uptake of vehicles running on alternative fuels or the ones related to insulation in, in, the, in the buildings. So that's about the main results of this activity. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Vera Rodrigues from University of Aveiro, and I'll share with you today the Aveiro case study of the Clare City project. Uh, well, I'll share my experience as an air quality modeler researcher while implementing engagement activities and showing the different approaches we have implemented in the region to engage and activate young citizens. While sharing these experiences, you will notice some difficulties an air quality modeler may face when turning into a science communicator. Under the framework of the Clare City, we have successfully engaged a very relevant number of young citizens. Keep going, I'll sort that out, sorry okay. about that. <laughs> okay. And that was only possible due to the strong collaboration we have established between the, um, our research team uh, from University of Aveiro, the team from the Aveiro region community, all the representatives from each one of the municipalities in the region, and all the teachers we have involved from the different schools. Um, under the framework of the Clare City, we have run two different approaches to engage and activate young citizens. The first one was the schools competition, My City, My School, My Home, already presented by Peter, which was an evidence of consulting and involving from the, this engagement continuum. And the second approach was a series of workshops we have run in different schools, where we talk about air pollution, climate change, and all all the related health related impacts as well as other impacts on our daily life. In this case, we were informing and also consulting and involving the young citizens depending on the activities we have run. So let's talk more in detail about these different approaches we have implemented in the region to engage and activate the young citizens, giving you a flavor of the difficulties a modeler may face when communicating science. Um, as I told you, through the um, school's competition, we have involved around 100 students. In this process, we have involved students and teachers from six municipalities, five of them within the region. And just for you to know, we have 11 municipalities in the, in the region of Aveiro. In this competition, we consulted young citizens, asking their uh, feedback on a set of policy measures and for alternatives. And we have also involved them asking their ideas, ensuring that their concerns and aspirations were consistently understood through the process. The second approach of engagement, the workshop series. Well, for some of these workshops, we were um, invited by the school and teachers to participate in some event they were already organizing. For example, this, um, this school, Gafanha uh, de Encarnação, they have organized the Health Week and they invited us to talk about the impacts of climate change and air pollution on our health. And for some others, we took the initiative to challenge the teachers like, hey, are you interested in at all by research to your students? And we are available and very keen to do it. For example, this school in Aveiro. Um, and from all these initiatives, very fruitful collaborations were born. Here you have a list of um, some examples of these workshops, but in total, we have reached more than 1,500 young citizens only with this uh, workshop series. And looking at the map of the region, we have been activating young citizens in six of the 11 municipalities of the region and an additional, an additional municipality outside the region in total from the combining the schools competitions and the workshops. Well, um, another example uh, is the successful case of the high school of Gafanha de Nazaré, the town located nearby the port of Aveiro. In this case, the school students and teachers were involved in both activities. We have run three different workshops at the school during uh, the year um, of 19, 
and they have also participated in the in the school competition. In addition to that, this school is running a set of innovative projects related with the topics of climate change, air pollution, and with a, a special focus on active mobility. In this case, besides informing, consulting, and involving, we are also collaborating with the schools, uh, with the schools and the students through different partnerships. This is a city with an old tradition of using the bike as a day-to-day -day transport. However, there uh, were some negative associations to the use of bike, like the poorest people that do not do not have money to buy a car are the one using a bike. Um, here you can see. Um, a video um, where you'll see how these kids are arriving to school and one of the big issues of this school is the fact they have this narrow street in front of the school in the morning and in the afternoon there are a lot of parents parking their car to drop their kids and this creates a chaotic situation so generating a peak of air pollutant emissions and the students and the teachers wanted to raise awareness of the parents either to stop using their cars or at least to park them in the neighborhood and not exactly in front of the school door, avoiding this high number of cars in front of the school. And our collaboration with the school in this project allows us to empower the young citizens to supporting them in this initiative. Um, well, here you can see example projects developed by the school, um, one about the um, the air quality within the school and the second one about the um, safe mobility. So if you want to know more about the, the, the first project, sorry, this one about um, the air quality at the school, you can have a look at the story map they have developed, the students together with their teachers. And um, this uh, another example is the Mobiset project. The main goal of the students were to work um, on safe mobility, and you have also this um, story map developed by the students and teachers where you can find more uh, information about. The students were collecting data from different colleagues and their daily trips, uh, home, school, home tracking the locations where they found barriers, um, for example, a cycle lane which suddenly stops to exist immediately before a hole and similar situations. Um, another example, and this one from the municipality already outside the region, a neighbor municipality. We had a previous collaboration with this school and they invited us to run several workshops. They participated also in the school competition Initially, the idea was to run the competition within the case study, thus these 11 municipalities uh, of the region. But of course, we couldn't say no to a group of students and teachers very interested in participate on that. So each year, the high school of this municipality, together with um, the school and the municipality, they organized this week for the changing climate. This uh, year, May 2020, we faced a special situation due to coronavirus. The teachers were very disappointed because it will not be possible to organize it and have our participation, but we have started discussion. We said something, uh, if you want, if you think it could be feasible and fruitful, we are available to do a similar session, but this time, of course, online. And we have done it. We have organized a set of four webinars and it was an amazing experience. The teachers involved on it have run a survey after the webinars to ask the students what went well, what could be improved, and the feedback was really positive. Um, another amazing initiative is this Mix and Move organized by the municipality of Oliveira do Bairro under the Mobility Week activities. Um, and you can see here my colleagues Sylvia and Kevin talking to an auditorium full of 400 students. And while the year before, another colleague, Miriam Lopes, have done a similar talk reaching another 400 students aged um, between 12 and 15 years old. Another example, a really special, uh, well, 
They are all very special, of course, but this primary school in Stareja, a big industrial town in the region, was really a challenge. This time I went to school with my colleague, Johnny, and I was really afraid because it was my first time talking to so young kids, most of them with eight and nine years old. And at the end, it was a success. I believe that the youngest kids are the most curious about these topics. They always want to know more and more, and they have always an experience to share with you about the things you were saying. You just want to state the topic, for example, how about renewable energy or clean energy, what you know about, and they will talk to you about all the experiences they know. This school was a great example of the need you have to always adapt your speech to the kids you, you are talking, depending on their age, and that we knew in advance but also depending on their economic background. Um, for instance, at this primary school, we're um, talking about Claire City, the game. We were not allowed to play it during our talk, but we mentioned it. And we said something like, today, when you go back home, you can ask your friends to play this game on your phone or tablet. But the thing is that some of them have like tablets to smartphones, and some of them have none of these things. And at that moment, you needed to find a solution to manage a problem you have created. And that's the challenge of doing these kind of activities. And I must say, it's not easy to stay away of your computer and your numerical simulations that do not complain with you. And go to the field and talk to a lot of kids. And each event was a very different experience, always with a very specific challenge you needed to solve in a minute. But at the end of the day, the best feeling you could have is some feedback from the teachers. Once uh, one told me, I never saw these kids so enthusiastic about something. And that's that's the, um, the beauty of the thing. And uh, a final example. Well, from that Zoom webinars about climate, climate change, it raised the question to me. Uh, how effective can I be with my message when I was discussing for an hour about climate change and at the end the kid asked me something like, the things you are showing about floods and heat waves and wildfires, as we all are going to die soon and there's nothing we can do. And the point is you need to be very clear, raising awareness of these young citizens to climate change. But you need to do that in a very effective way. They cannot lose their hope. And that's it. Thanks. Okay. Um, <clears throat> afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to discuss you today uh, a new uh, EU project called WeCant, uh, which has been up and running for about uh, 10 months now. Um, and the main aim of we count is to actually engage people with uh, conversations around um, local transport. And in particular, uh, we're trying to seek uh, to engage young people um, in this uh, citizen science initiative. As a methodology, I think citizen science has, has grown quite substantially uh, in recent years. We're seeing it across a number of different scientific disciplines because it creates new knowledge. It helps policymakers. It gets people engaged uh, in a conversation about specific issues. It also provides um, uh, great uh, spatial and, and indeed temporal data that can feed into uh, various different uh, research questions. Um, but the methodology itself can be fraught with a number of difficulties. Things like quality assurance, the integrity of data, how do you balance the kind of representat representativity of different citizens within the project? How do you manage a large number of volunteers, keep them involved, keep them motivated? Um, but what we have seen in citizen science is that it's becoming more and more uh, popular uh, in recent years across a range of disciplines, whether it's uh, air pollution or transport counting or counting and identifying butterfly moths. There's an application for citizen science uh, just about everywhere. Um, and what's really interesting about the approach is that you can apply it in all these different areas and you can actually learn from um, each different uh, project and each different discipline in terms of how you can implement the met implement the methodology to maximize the benefits and uh, minimize any difficulties that you may have. So the week 
Ecom project uh, is using citizen science uh, to basically start a conversation with uh, the public. So uh, basically, there are plenty of opinionated and sometimes even militant citizens already engaged in the conversation uh, around the urban mobility, but often the younger voice is not really heard uh, in this area. So what we count is trying to do to work with uh, local communities, not just young people, but all elements of community to quantify local road transport, produce new knowledge about local mobility, and then to work with the communities to co-create solutions that have been informed by the evidence that we generated on urban mobility challenges. And this can be anything from air pollution to active travel, rat running, speeding, peak transport episodes. Really, the, the research question is, de is devised by the citizen science community rather than imposed on them by ourselves. And we're doing this across uh, five different pilots in six cities and regions. Uh, Leuven in Belgium, Madrid and Barcelona in Spain, Ljubljana in Slovenia, Dublin in Ireland and Cardiff in Wales. And the reason we chose these cities is diversity. They've all got a range of different challenges. They've all got a range of different transport issues, different capacities, different air quality challenges. Uh, and by uh, having these number of different cities, we can test the scientific robustness of our approach, but also its flexibility in different environments and different areas. So how work? Well, it's, it's actually a relatively simple project. We're using a sensor called a TELRAM. Uh, a TELRAM in Dutch uh, basically translates as abacus, but if you break it apart, TEL and RAM, it means a uh, window counter. And that's effectively what it is. It's a sensor that sits in an upstairs window with a clear view of the road. And then the sensor via an algorithm in a Raspberry Pi counts the number of cars, large vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians that are going past uh, your window and can also assess uh, car speeds in terms of the, the number of cars traveling at a particular speed. Now, while it is a, a camera connected to a Raspberry Pi, it's not actually any images. For privacy reasons, there is no image collected. It kind of works like a motion sensor in that it looks at a vehicle as it passes in front of the window. It looks at the shape of the vehicle and then it makes a determination as to whether it's a car, a large vehicle or indeed a, a cyclist or a pedestrian. Now, the WeCount project is working with local communities to establish these networks in neighborhoods. And we're engaging with everyone from uh, schools networks um, all the way to established uh, communities, uh, to employers, to uh, areas that, that the local authority may already have a, of concern, such as uh, air quality management areas in particular um, uh, um, uh, around particular uh, busy roads. And by generating this, uh, this spatial and temporal data about transport, we can actually then start to facilitate local workshops, local discussions to work with communities to utilize that data to create new knowledge on the problem that they've got, but also then to help these citizen scientists evolve from scientists into citizen advocates so they can actually start to co-create and uh, generate solutions that they can put in place um, while working with key stakeholders. And the project itself is aiming for a minimum of 1,500 citizen scientists across our case studies. We're aiming for a 50-50 split in terms of gender. And at the moment, our split is roughly 44% male and 56% female. We've also got an ambition to try and reach um, um, lower socioeconomic backgrounds so that we make the technology and make these sort of projects more accessible to audiences that don't typically engage with this process. And indeed, we're also trying to engage with a range of different ages. Typically, citizen science projects can often be male, 40s to 50s, uh, middle aged, middle incomed. Um, and we're trying to break uh, that mold and engage a much more diverse uh, um, group and audiences in our different cities. So the project itself, in terms of, of an approach, uh, phase one is obviously around recruitment. And then we get into a, a five stage process. Uh, the first two stages are really about bringing the communities together and actually work them to, to generate a common consensus in terms of what are the local transport problems that they want to address. How can the WeCount project actually address that problem and then devise a citizen led um, uh, um, research or suite of research questions? 
We then established the sensor networks and start uh, gathering the data and put these communities into action in terms of generating not only Telegram data, but also observational data about their local transport. We then bring that data together and facilitate um, analysis sessions where we start to understand what the data is telling us in more detail. And then a discuss with the various stakeholders, not just the citizen groups, but also uh, local consultants, local NGOs, local uh, the authorities, what actions they may want to implement and put in place. And finally, a reflection in terms of did we achieve our goals and thinking about the transferable lessons that we learned from the project and also about uh, understanding have we given the, the, these communities um, the ability to sustain beyond the lifetime of the project, so there's a legacy going forward. So in terms of young people, it, it's, it's an ambition of the project to try and engage more young people uh, in, in its work. At the moment, uh, the breakdown suggests um, that about 34% of the people participating uh, come from, we say, the, the younger voices in our communities. Um, but what has been noticeable is that the young voice is often very visible or very vocal when it comes to environmental issues such as climate change or air pollution. And I think we see this through things like the youth strikes. We see this through Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and it's kind of the, the Greta Thunberg effect, if you like, in that we've got a very vocal voice when it comes to the impact. What we don't necessarily see is the same vocal young voice when we actually move upstream and think about the sources of these issues and the sources of these problems. So by engaging that young voice higher up in uh, this, this problem uh, pathway, we're hoping to um, get um, much better insights into how we might challenge or um, address these issues such as transport. We're also finding that young people are really, really busy. They've got school, they've got lots of holiday hobbies, they're spending time with their friends. So we have to be quite targeted in terms of how we recruit them and how we get them, get them involved. And there are a number of different ways to do this. I mean, schools are obviously gateways to these young people and these young people are obviously gateways uh, to a number or to their, to their families and to their friends. Um, but things like school clubs, so eco clubs, local initiatives uh, like um, active travel initiatives or uh, street school initiatives um, can be great ways to to get in and to target and to recruit uh, young people to these projects. We're also noticing that citizen science is actually giving young people a, a sense of independence. They are their own scientists. They're in charge of their own project. They're in charge of their own sensor and that they feel like they're, they're a much more independent uh, voice within the project and also that they have a, an equitable or a, a, an equal voice around the table when it comes to the, the co-creation of solutions. We're finding that they, they think it's important to understand, um, to, to engage with these projects from different motivations. Sometimes it can be from a learning or a STEM point of view. Sometimes it can be in terms of career development and skills development. Sometimes it's a sense of empowerment and tapping into that motivation uh, can be a really important way of getting people engaged. And finally, STEM is a great way of, of reaching out to young people and helping them uh, get involved in these sort of initiatives. And the technical nature of, of the project in terms of the sensors and in terms of the data analysis we're finding is often uh, more appealing uh, to, to younger people. So that's the WECOM project. As I mentioned, we've been up and running for uh, uh, 10 months. Uh, the case studies in uh, Madrid, Barcelona and Leuven are pretty well established at this stage. And uh, the case studies in Cardiff, Ljubljana and Dublin are gaining momentum uh, day by day. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Ender. I know you have to pop off to another session, but we have one question quickly for you, if you don't mind answering. Um, we've got a message from the audience around um, whether the We Camp project is linking to any of the school curriculum with regards to its engagement and maybe potential activities. I know it's early stages at this point, but do you have any plans for doing that? Um, so it varies with um, it, it varies with case studies. I think the the Cardiff case study and the Dublin case study in particular have um, tried to focus on engaging with schools and and with a younger audience. It's really really difficult to actually engage directly with the curriculum because of the nature of the fact that the curriculum is set so far in advance. 
Um, but certainly what we've been doing is trying to work through things like eco clubs and trying to work through things like um, active travel networks that the councils may have established for different schools and also local initiatives like living streets where they've got these these school streets and initi initiatives um, that encourage uh, more sustainable modes of traffic. We've been using those to try and engage uh, with our schools and get them involved. But getting it directly onto the curriculum is always a challenge. So it's it's usually those um, uh, it's those uh, ancillary um, clubs and ancillary activities that we're trying to tap into. Great, thank you, Enda. Um, and thanks for all the speakers for um, their really interesting um, reflections and uh, points about their projects. So we're going to now break up um, our session with a bit of a, a breakout. Uh, but before we do so, um, I'm just going to suggest that rather than actually going into breakout rooms, we all just speak together on this platform, uh, considering there's just a small intimate number of us. Um, so my suggestion is if Vera wouldn't mind uh, sharing her slides that she's had prepared in advance. So I'll stop sharing the slides of this one now. If she wouldn't mind sharing her continuum slides. We will talk you through our instructions for what we'd like us to do now for the next five to ten minutes. I'll just let her load those and uh, a reflection from from my end, as you can see with the projects that we've been um, presenting to you, it really does take a whole host of different activities and reaching out kind of beyond the normal places that you would consider engaging, say, younger audiences. Um, we've done everything from brownies clubs to schools to uh, public events. Um, so it's really worth bearing that in mind uh, when you are engaging yes. younger audiences. Okay. So Vera is going to be sharing her slides momentarily. Yes, I think that are they already? No. Yeah, we can see them. Please go ahead. Okay. So um, the idea is to spend like ten minutes uh, to do these activities, and we'll work with sticky notes. And each person will take a sticky note to allocate to a type of engagement. And they are checkbox if you prefer. So the idea is to to allocate um, all these notes, um, mobile, for instance, mobile decision making to influence policy. As an example, the Clare City Skylines. Is this an example of inform, consult, involve, collaborate, or involve from this um, continuum, engagement continuum Sophie has uh, discussed? So I'll start to ask uh, Diogo. For example, um, if we can go ahead. So, are you are you seeing my screen, my my slide? I think you might need to go back a slide. Okay. And okay. now, okay. So, um, Diogo, can you please go ahead choosing this uh, for the um, yellow sticky note? If it should move to inform, consult, involve, collaborate, or it, if it's an example of empower. Sophie, do you mind to check the chat sure. box? If yeah. something is. Yeah, Diego, you should be able to turn on your mic, but if not, you're welcome to um, post in the chat box. Uh, to make things a little bit easier, I'll just um, do, select the first one and put that where I think on the continuum, just as an example. Uh, I think your Wi-Fi cut out at one moment, just um, so I thought it might be best if we do it together, then people know um, what to expect. So, for example, the mobile decision making game, um, you can see there it says about influencing policy. So it's moving us away from informing. And I would say you probably put it towards something like collaborate. So I would suggest putting it there for the something time being. Like that. Something like this, right? Yes, thanks. 
And now um, for the um, science lessons and public events, um, can you please choose someone to, to work with? Margarita on? has posted in the yeah. chat that she thinks it is to consult. Okay. So. And can you can you add right. something? I meant in form. Sorry, I meant in form, not consult. Okay. That's it. Thank you. And the next one, the blue uh, about interactive educational tools about um, air pollution and as an example, a uh, board game. Um, if I may, I would. Yeah, sorry. If I may, I would put it to consult. I think. Okay. Would you mind explaining your justification in a sentence yeah, or two? Because, yeah, because I was just thinking on what Margarita said as well, because the science lessons and public events for me was either inform or consult, but then I, I would rather say for that that it's informed, but, but the educational tool, if it's an interactive thing, it's more about discussing with the children uh, the problems and the solutions. So I, I would say it's more a consult thing. I, I agree with, with Pete. It's really difficult to 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 make a decision based just on science lessons because and public events, as it depends on how interactive they are. So uh, when I said inform, I assumed it was a very formal science lesson or a very formal public event where you just, uh, as a member of the public, you just talked at rather than are involved in a conversation. Yeah, of course, then depending on the activities you are running during these lessons or events, if you are doing, for instance, a game with the, the, the students, it could be already um, for the consult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and now the formal education program. And as a, an example, we have the, um, the school competition from Claire City, my skill, my, my city, my school, my home. And there's some volunteer to place this uh, pin card. Empower, maybe? Empower. Can you, can you please add um, why are you putting? I think it will involve uh, students. Uh, younger kids so decision and i think you would be giving them kind of power so that so maybe that's what that's my opinion okay and for um for the last one after school volunteer programs like steam or eco club the eco club um there's someone who uh, wants to to place this uh, note be great to hear from someone uh, we haven't heard from Ava, would you like to say? Okay, I open up to anybody on the floor. <laughs> okay. I, I, if I might say something, um, I think this one is quite tricky because on, on one hand, you're definitely involving the participants in your topic. But on the other hand, I feel that by attending an after school program, you're, you're also empowering the participants to make that decision. So, yeah, <laughs> that was we'll do, also. We'll do something like this. Yes, yeah, I think so. Because with this kind of 
programs we are also supporting the um, the young citizens to give them the tools to um, to support their um, their fights let's say their um, activities absolutely not only and initiatives with, with tools as you said vera um yeah, definitely. I feel this could be very empowering for the participants. Yeah, and I think that it will depend on the level of engagement of these young um, citizens, because um, with respect to these formal educational programs like the schools competition, it could be also similar to that. It could be also an example of involvement, because through these tools, you are involving the students participating in this activity. But at the same time, if they have already some topics that they care about, it could be the tools that they needed to support their, their initiatives. At the same time, these formal educational programs like My City, My School, My Home can also serve as an opportunity to consult so if you may you can copy that yeah, yeah. That's it, and put it under consult because it might be a good opportunity to consult with younger people as well and receive their feedback exactly okay yeah yeah just to add to this because uh, when we developed the activity and and the software and as i mentioned in the presentation so it was a tool really to uh, to engage the children and and to get them thinking on on the topic, and of course it depends on on the teacher and and also on the activity and the implementation of the activity where it goes at the end. So it's only a consulting or or more an involvement, or even more. So it's, it's it, there is the possibility. Thanks everybody. Okay. I'll just make wait for one more minute just in case we've got any final comments. Um, but as you can see here, uh, we could keep multiplying these post-it notes. <laughs> uh, so I guess a lot of what we've been saying here is it's not only the, the type of program that's been created, it's how it's delivered, it's the content, it's the willingness of the students themselves. It's so many, so many dimensions here that we have to consider. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's food for thought and knowing that you can't always put things into uh, boxes quite neatly <laughs> as most of us probably know uh, so just to conclude we're gonna end with some chance for final questions and for um, a little reflection so if you wouldn't mind stopping sharing your slides please Vera and I will just end with our concluding slide so first we'll go to a few of the questions that were posed uh, so here we go. I'm just going to read through some of them now. Uh, so Vera's kindly answered some of her activity, uh, her, some of her questions in the chat box already. And we had one more generally um, that I'm happy to answer, which was around uh, the use of all of our different educator packs, communicator packs, um, etc. And um, one is whether we actually have records of these packs, so where are they kind of housed, where are they being stored, and how are we promoting them now, now that our project has ended and that we're living in these COVID times. So the first point to raise is that, of course, we've got our website in which you can see all of our resources there. But in addition, we are also keeping all of our resources on a platform called Zenodo, uh, which will remain open source, open access um, long after the project has ended and potentially even our website uh, no longer exists. So I'm happy to share that link with anybody afterwards. So do message me um, if you would like that. I'm leaving my email on the last slide. And then the other part is about how they're being used now. So there's been a few opportunities that we've had with these resources. Um, we're connected with a bunch of networks in Bristol and nationally. Um, for example, students organising for sustainability, curiosity connections in Bristol, um, the council, for example, and some of their educational practitioners. And we have been sharing those resources on those platforms and we continue to promote them through events like this, for example, 
before and um, elsewhere. So even though we, we're no longer working on the project, it does tie in quite nicely to WeCamp, for example, and we're trying to find ways to promote them um, as and when opportunities arise. And then we have a question for Peter about the um, my city, my school, my city, my home, um, and wanting to know whether the resource is still available as well um, and where educators might be able to access um, the education program and perhaps they could use it for their own education or is there something similar that they can make use of in their future work? Uh, well, an offline uh, an offline version of the of the measures and the, and the questionnaire is available in the educator pack, where, which was developed, and the online version is also available still. Uh, but we are still figuring out how it would be available for everybody because as we used it through the schools after re registration, it's it's it still has this element, but we are working on to to make it free as well. Great, thanks Peter. Um, I believe that's all the questions that we have. So the one final question that we'd like to pose to the audience uh, is what one new idea will you take from this session? So if you wouldn't mind going into the chat box once again and just posting a kind of takeaway point that you'll have from today's session or do feel free to turn on the mic and respond um, to this question that we're posing to you. And uh, the speakers are also allowed <laughs> to write their takeaway as well if they would in the chat box. So as I allow you to do that, um, I just wanted to say thank you um, from both myself and all of the team today. We've really appreciated, appreciated having you here and interacting with us. Um, we, as mentioned, have a couple of web uh, websites that you can check out, clarecity.eu and we-count.net. So do um, follow up with those to access our resources and sign up to newsletters, etc. And if you would like to get in touch with myself or Ender, who is leading on the WeCount project, then I have left our email addresses here. So feel free to take a photo and to get in touch if you would like any more information. So that is all from us today. Thanks once again. I hope you enjoy the rest of the EU Green Week uh, activities um, and hope you found this useful for your work in this space. Uh, so best of luck and uh, thank you very much.